houses mostly our 18th century collection, um, which goes from early, late eight, 17th century to mid 19th century. And then we also have the Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Folk Art Museum, which was established in 1957 by John D. Rockefeller Jr. and his children to house Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller's collection of folk art, which at the time was only about 400 pieces, and we now have about four to 5,000 um, folk art pieces. That's a sizable collection. Yes. Now, for folks who may not have visited Colonial Williamsburg for the last few years, can you tell us a little bit about the new aspect front of the building and what went into planning that? Yeah, we're excited to have a new entrance to the museum and more space. Um, the, decor the Decorative Arts Museum and the Folk Art Museum are now all on one site. And so we've added to those two buildings to create a better entrance, have more gallery space, and better staff areas where we can all collaborate more. Yeah, it's a significant change. It is. Excellent. All right. Well, Jan, thank you for that introduction to the Museums of Colonial Williamsburg. Now, let's take a moment to find out more about the planning that goes into the creation of museum exhibitions here at Colonial Williamsburg. Our exhibitions usually begin with an idea, usually from a curator who wants to talk about a particular object, maybe it's silver, or they have a good idea about a theme like furnishing Williamsburg. Some of these exhibits are only maybe five, ten objects, whereas others can be as much as 200 objects. Everything kind of starts with the idea and then moves into the planning process once that idea has been approved by our exhibition committee. Once the exhibition committee has approved an exhibit, the curator will take that and expand upon the storyline, develop an object list, and then present that work with the designer to come together with how that might fit into the gallery space. The curator will take back that information and begin to write labels and to look at the objects and to work with conservators to determine if the objects are suitable for exhibition, whether they're stable enough to go on exhibit, whether they might need treatment. Meanwhile, the designer is working on his design plan, seeing how many of these objects will fit into the exhibition space. Do they need cases? Do they need to hang on the wall? What spaces they might take up within that gallery? And as the two of them are working somewhat separately, they then come back together to discuss a final plan that is then approved and we begin to involve more and more people into that plan. The designer then goes to his design team and starts to work out more details, like who's going to make the decks or the cases. Then we go to the mount maker who needs to determine how many of these objects need to have special mounts made so that they can be shown. When the designer has a full design in mind, he's usually working on the computer, developing a plan that eventually gets onto paper. Sometimes it's better or easier to work with the design plan if it's in three dimensions. So we'll have scale models built where we can miniaturize all of our objects and place them around. And that way we can really see, is it really gonna fit as we think it will when it's in two dimension on paper, a little bit easier to tell that if it's a little three dimensional model. And that has really helped us out a lot when planning certain exhibits. Once the designer has showed his design plan to the exhibit team, each of those people thinks about how they're going to accomplish the tasks. The mount maker will work with the objects and the curator and the designer to determine how will that object look in the space? What support does it need and what angle might it be shown at? And then he works in sometimes plexiglass, sometimes metals, brass, as for mount making. And then once those mounts are made, they are turned over to a conservation technician who will paint those to match the object so that the mount really sort of disappears, which is really the idea. You want to focus on the object, not the mount. And then when it comes to installation, the mount maker will be there to help install that along with the curator and the installers. When the fabricator works in the wood shop to construct items based on the plan, such as decks or cases where the objects are going to be, maybe there's some panels that need to be made for labels, he goes from a scale drawing from the designer, works out how much material is needed, 
and then begins his construction, which then will ultimately go to the painter who needs to paint that, maybe the same color as the walls, maybe not, depending on what the designer's look is. So all of that is considered and can take several months really to figure out just right going through mock-ups and discussions, design process. And then once the design is figured out, those can be printed, they have to be mounted on a board like map board, and then again, they're installed. As can happen sometimes with a live event, sometimes things don't go perfectly, so we apologize for some technical issues that we had. Just to start us over again a bit, I'm Linda Randolfe, and I'm here today with Jen Gillum, who is here to talk about how exhibitions are planned and implemented at the Art Museums of Colonial Williamsburg. So Jan is ready to answer some of your questions, so please continue to post them in our comments. The Art Museums of Colonial Williamsburg showcase the Foundation's vast folk art and decorative arts collections, as well as archeological and architectural material culture, all integral to understanding the stories of history. Now let's get started with some questions from our audience. One of our viewers would like to know, how long does it take for you to plan an exhibition? That can take anywhere from several months to several years to put together. I've worked on exhibitions that have taken as much as five years from the concept through the research to the installation of the exhibition. And I would imagine that sometimes you have to plan exhibitions based on anniversaries that are important in a historic area or certain calendar events? We do. We plan around the schedules, um, either in programming or through educational programs or the exhibitions. Of course, we're looking forward to 2026 and the 100th anniversary of Colonial Williamsburg, and so we're already in the stages of planning that exhibition. Excellent. Um, how often are the exhibitions changed? Well, we try and do three to four new exhibitions a year, but we have well over 25 galleries in the museums to work at, so some are longer term exhibits than others. All right, and um, because of the range of items that you have in the collection, from the very small to the very large, can you talk a little bit about what it takes to get those done? Yes, sometimes our exhibitions are only a few objects and some are several, but we've worked on things like a fire engine, and um, we put in a set of stairs on the second floor, uh, 18th century stairs for exhibit, and we work on very small objects like miniatures in the toy collection or small coins that are in our collection. Fascinating. All right, Shelley would like to know, where does the construction for the mounts and carpenter work take place before the installation? Fortunately, with the expansion of the museum, we now have a large space where we're all close together, and so we have a cabinet shop, um, and we have a mount making shop that can do welding and um, all sorts of production work, and it's all within just a few steps of each other. Excellent. Um, and another viewer would like you to tell us a little bit more about how people gain the skills to create the mounts that are used for certain objects. Each of the jobs we have that work with um, the exhibits are pretty specialized. Someone, the mount makers, they often are working with brass or with acrylics, and a lot of that is on the job training, but there are areas where you can gain that experience. Um, the graphic designer has often gone to school for graphic design work and then learning all the computer skills needed for that as well as working with the different machines. Okay. Um, another question is, what is the type of education you need to work in the profession that you do? Well, I got my degree in history and museum studies, master's at William and Mary, and um, other curators have gone to uh, schools where they do have a museum studies program and working directly with objects, which is always very helpful, and internships are a really big thing that really help you get further in the field. Yeah, excellent. Um, so are there other exhibitions uh, that take place across the historic area of Colonial Williamsburg that are not just in the museum? Well, of course, all of our exhibition buildings we consider an exhibit in themselves, mm -hmm. but the John D. Rockefeller Library also has a small exhibition space, and they're often changing that a couple times a year. And we also have at the uh, Bruton Heights School complex, we have an exhibition about the original Bruton Heights School. Very good. Uh, Michael would like to know, what is the most complex exhibition you have ever worked on? 
Oh, wow, that, that's a tough one. Um, I would say one of the ones that was also my favorite exhibition uh, was a tool exhibit that we did in the early 1990s. And we worked with historic area staff, but we, the exhibit took over two gallery spaces and we built environments for what an 18th century tool area would look like and how the tools were used. So it was very complex. I would imagine so. Um, Tina would like to know, have any exhibit topics ever been rejected or nixed? Actually, they're, most of the ones that come up have been fine. The, sometimes it's more a matter of not that the topic is bad, but it doesn't fit into the schedule mm -hmm. at the moment. We always try to make sure that we're not working on like two ceramic exhibits at the same time, and that means that something else isn't getting worked on. So Excellent. we try and make a variety. Very good. How singular is it for a museum to have staff on site to do all the work involved in curating exhibitions? We are very fortunate to have not only our exhibit staff all on site to do the graphic work, mount making, but we also have the resources of Colonial Williamsburg. Behind the scenes, folks like the electricians, as well as the trades folks who can help us build 18th century reproductions or anything we might need for the exhibits. Very good. Well, thank you for those viewer questions. And now let's learn more about how the exhibition process works. Remember, please post your questions in the comments. The manager of preventive conservation is also involved not only in the gallery spaces, keeping them clean, but also in the process of developing the exhibit. A lot of the materials we use within cases have to be tested to make sure that they are not harmful to the objects that will be in those cases. So small samples of those materials will be given to her and she will test them to make sure they're safe for use. She's also the one who helps paint out some of the mounts so that you don't notice them. This, she'll be involved in installation as well as the final cleaning of the exhibition before we actually open. If we have a video component or we need sound, like we're working on a music exhibition, so we'll need sound component, we go to our AV technician who then works through what kind of hardware we'll need so that you can see the video or hear the sound and she works with the designer and curator to make sure that it's appropriate for the storyline that they're trying to tell. The graphic designer has a big job in turning all of the curator's words into something that guests will actually read. So you want it to look attractive, the size of the labels have to be right so that visitors are comfortable reading it, the contrast between the words and the background of the labels, all sorts of things figure into what size the labels are going to be, will they fit in the space. The museum educator becomes involved in the process once the storyline is really complete. The curator and the museum educator talk about what the goals are of the exhibition, what the possibilities might be once the exhibition is open. Sometimes that's a special tour that's given, or there might be a craft that might be associated with it, maybe particularly for children. Sometimes we develop family guides that take guests through the space or maybe it takes them outside the space. For the architectural exhibition that we're working on right now, we hope to have a guide that will take you into the historic area to show you what they've seen in the museum can also be seen in the historic area. Once all of those jobs have been completed, we end up with the gallery painted, full of objects, but you also have to be able to see the object, so we need some final lighting, and we have a lighting designer who will come in and make sure that the objects are lit appropriately. Sometimes if you have something like textiles, you can't have very high light levels, so you have to balance the light on the object and what it takes for visitors to see it. So they work with that, making sure there's enough light to read the labels and enough light to enjoy the exhibition. Then we do a final cleaning, and then finally we're able to actually open the exhibition to our guests, which is our ultimate goal. Once the exhibition is open and guests are enjoying it, the staff is hard at work on the next series of exhibitions, whether it's one or two, or often we're working as many as five or six of them. We try and open about three or four exhibitions a year. If you can't make it to that exhibition, you might look on our website. Many of our exhibitions are on virtual tours, showing you a 360 of those spaces. That was an amazing look into what it takes to create exhibitions. 
Uh, Jan, we have more audience caught questions for you, including uh, could you explain a little bit more about the whole area of online components that are now part of any exhibition? Yeah, now we work, uh, work more and more to think about technology, not only um, online, but also in the exhibitions. Is it something that would add to it if we, a video or sound, like a, for our music exhibit coming up, we're going to be adding sound. Uh, but yeah, we also look at online. We have 360 online exhibitions, so that if you can't make it here, you can at least get a sense of what exhibits are on view. And that must add a whole additional level of preparation and timing and planning right. to coordinate. Yes, and working with more people who have different experiences. Excellent. Um, Barb would like to know, how do you decide what actually gets into an exhibition? We have a couple criteria is, does it fit the theme that we're looking for? Is it um, really going to add to the exhibition? We also have to uh, look at, can it be on view? Is it stable enough? Is there some issue with the object that would make it unsafe to show? Um, sometimes that can be, if it goes through conservation and gets treated, that will um, help us put it on view. Sometimes it might be just too fragile to use. All right. Um, another viewer would like to know, what is the oldest object, or what are some of the oldest objects in Colonial Williamsburg's collection? Basically, our collection is primarily late 17th century through the 19th century for the decorative arts side. Um, but we do have a good archaeological collection, uh -huh. and that takes us really far back into things that are um, a couple thousand years old. We have um, one object on view right now that is a pot um, dug up at the Custis site that's been excavated in recent years. And um, so there are very old pieces in the collection. I would imagine so. Um, another question is, what are your biggest challenges when mounting an exhibition? It's keeping everybody um, on time because there could be delays. Some, you know, if some supplies don't come in, then that person might be a little bit late. If um, we're working on something and it takes a little bit longer than we thought, so we have to keep constantly adjusting the schedule so that we can stay on time. Very good. Um, Jen, what is your favorite exhibition? As I mentioned, the tool exhibit is one, but also uh, soon after I started um, working at the art museums, uh, I was able to curate uh, an exhibit called Take Joy, which was the art of Tasha Tudor, and was actually able to meet the artist, which I had grown up reading her books, so it was something that was really, something I never thought I would do. Yeah. So that was really quite fun. Fantastic. Um, another question is, why is Colonial Williamsburg's exhibitions so unique? What makes them special? I think it's um, the range of things that we have in the collection and the resources that we have to be able to show guests things from the 18th century and then they can walk a few blocks down the street and they're actually in that environment. So it's really special to have that connection. Roughly how many objects are in the collection? Oh, we probably have over 70,000 objects. Those are ones that are in the historic area, um, in storage or at the museum, and that does not count the archeological collection, which makes it just much, much more. All right. Um, what future exhibitions uh, can our viewers expect to see in the near time? Well, right now we're working on restoring Williamsburg, which is about the architecture of Williamsburg that will open in April. And then we're also working on an exhibit called Making Music, which is about music in the 18th century. And we have one coming up later in the year, uh, Stitched in Time, Needlework. And then we're also working on one, I Made This, Black Artists and Artisans, which should be about October. Very good. Jan, how often does Colonial Williamsburg provide or loan items in our collection to other museums and vice versa. How, do, we, do we frequently engage other museums and ask to we put do. some of their We do. We like to work with other museums and we'll often loan objects to them. And we will also ask for loans if it's something that we don't have in the collection we think would add to the exhibition. So we will do that. I would imagine that that adds a whole other additional layer. That adds of, a few more people to the yeah. schedule that we have to keep track of. Yeah, and coordinating transportation, right. all those yeah. details. All right, um, one of our viewers would like to know, why are the rooms in the uh, 
museum name? You'll notice as you go through the galleries up high, there are names on the walls. These are the names of the people who have donated money to the museum. The expansion was completely funded by donations. Many of those came from people who uh, wanted to help us out by naming the gallery spaces. Absolutely. And they also fund our exhibitions yeah. as well. It's a great reminder of how important donors it are is. to Very Colonial so. Williamsburg. Yes. Excellent. All right, where does Colonial Williamsburg get the objects it exhibits? We've been collecting objects since the 1930s, and we actively will go out and seek something that if we have uh, an area that we would like to have more of, uh, we'll seek those out maybe through auction or um, purchase of some sort. We also are often uh, gifted objects, either um, by working with somebody or through bequests. And um, Colonial Williamsburg, if you will, had a head start through Abby Aldridge Rockefeller's collection, right? Yes. Between the foundation. Yes. Could you that was talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, Abby Aldridge Rockefeller was very interested in American folk art long before people were really keen on what folk art was. And so by gifting her collection to us, it started the first um, folk art museum in America. All right. Well, one audience question is uh, they, they enjoy they enjoy seeing the more contemporary folk art. And are there any upcoming exhibits showcasing contemporary folk artists? Yes, the I Made This exhibition that will feature black artists and artisans is going to be 18th century all the way to the present day. So we will have objects that were made in the 20th, 20th century. All right. That sounds like an exciting... It is. It's going to be a fun exhibit. Very good. We are almost out of time, so let's go to another question, which is, what kind of satisfaction do you personally get at seeing these exhibitions come to life? It's quite satisfying when you've worked on a project for several years, or even if it's just a year or so, it's satisfying to see it all come together like you thought it might, and sometimes even better. Um, and then my office happens to be at the museum, so I walk through it every day, and when you can see guests really enjoying it, actually reading the labels, asking questions, it's really kind of nice to see that. Has there been any big change in what you've seen over the years from the time when you started doing this work to now? What are some of the big changes that you're seeing, if any? Yeah, we see the um, change in what visitors are interested in. Um, we, the ch way we have written labels will sometimes kind of evolve over time to kind of keep up with what people want to read about. Excellent. So yeah, it has changed. Well, thank you, Jan. Well, the expertise it takes to plan, design, and implement an exhibition is varied, and the talents needed are many. It is indeed a display of amazing teamwork. Thank you, Jan, and your colleagues in the museums for sharing your enthusiasm about this important work. Video of this program will be available for viewing at colonialwilliamsburg.org, our Facebook page, and our YouTube channel. Colonial Williamsburg relies on the generosity of guests and donors like you. This project was funded in part by a generous grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. We hope you'll join us on Friday, March 25th, for Covering America with Quilts, a program on the current Art of the Quilter exhibition at the Art Museums of Colonial Williamsburg. Join us to learn how quilts tell us about people of the past. And remember, when you're considering history, always consider the sources.